Good morning, and uh, I'm going to give you a teaser for United with Christ coming up in a few minutes. We're going to continue our series, Make Every Effort to Add to Your Faith. So this is United with Christ for January 25th, 2023. So come back and join us as we continue to add the attributes we're supposed to add to our faith. United with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning and welcome back. My name is Mark Schumacher. I'm with New Wine Fellowship Church here in El Paso. Welcome to United with Christ for January 25th, 2024. We're going to finish up our series on 2 Peter chapter 1. And again, making every effort, being diligent to add these attributes to your faith. I'm joined again this morning by my friend and co-pastor, a uh, pastor in the church, uh, Robert Dominguez. And uh, Robert, why don't you go ahead and pray for us? And do you mind reading these uh, verses 1 5 through 9 again? It'd be my pleasure. Let's go ahead and pray together and ask God to guide our time, give us revelation so that we could apply the truths that we're learning. And we also always want to remind you that you could call this station, call the number below your screen, so that we could have people who are eager to pray and ask God to help you in this life that He's given us. So let's take this time to pray right now. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us a new day of life a day that we could have peace and joy in you. And Father, we thank you for TV programs such as these, that we could share your word with those who are willing to hear and who want to grow in a knowledge of you so that they could grow in you, Father. So we ask that you guide our time right now this morning, that you speak to us through your word, that you give us wisdom and insight, and that you help us be able to apply all that you're teaching us in our daily living so that we can live lives that are worthy of you and bring you glory. Father, bless everyone who is watching. Bless them, provide for their needs. We thank you for all that you give. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Well, again, we're going to be in 2 Peter today, chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 5, and we're going to read all the way through verse 9. So let's go ahead and jump there now. For this very reason, Peter writes, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Amen. Thank you. And a quick recap again, grace and peace is yours abundance through the knowledge of God and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, make every effort. We've got to be diligent in this. Live intentionally. And real quick, we did, we did goodness and knowledge. And last week, Robert and I did self-control and perseverance. We talked about it. So to this week, we're going to talk about add to your faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, and add godliness. So we'll talk about godliness for a minute. Godliness is kind of designed. I think the word is better defined as giving honor or a life giving honor and paying homage to God. In other words, honoring God. And sometimes we think godliness looks like something, but it's not what it looks like. It's mm. really about the heart, isn't mm -hmm. it? It is about the heart. And the interesting one, the one who talked a lot about godliness is Paul's and his instructions to Timothy. So I'm going to let you, if you want to take a couple of these and kind of expound upon them, or if you got others, that's fine there. Yeah, and I think to Pastor Mark's point about the connection between godliness and reverence is seen very directly in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. If we go there, Paul writes to Timothy, for kings and all who are in authority, he's talking to pray for them mm -hmm. so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Mark was spot on because if you look at that Greek word for um, 
godliness, one of the words that you see is, is piety. Yeah. It's to be pious. And well, one of the words, if you get your dictionary out, like, well, what does pious mean? Piety meaning it means reverence or a deep respect and honor for God. And I, what I love, what Pastor Mark, what you're saying is the attitude of having this reverence or this attitude of having a fear for God. Yes. And when I think of godliness, who has best exhibited godliness ever? What human being was almost a depiction of God, I'd say, who was a depiction of God, the one who said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, Jesus Christ. Yes. Jesus Christ is our perfect example of godliness, the way that he lived his life. And what was the attitude of Jesus? was a reverence, was an honor, was a respect for the Father who gladly did the will of the Father, who gladly lived for the Father out of that desire to honor and to revere and to respect God. So that's, that's something that we, we want to aspire for as children of God. We want to be like Christ in being like Christ, who is like God because he is God. So that's why we want to have that heart attitude of reverence. We're and, familiar with that passage where Peter says uh, when he was reviled or when he was attacked, mm -hmm. he didn't attack back. He didn't defend himself, but rather he submitted himself to the judgment of the righteous father. Okay. Our life is our submitting ourselves to the judgment of the righteous father. If we honor the Lord, go ahead. I'll go back to you. you so we, we start seeing that we want to have this Godliness seen in our attitude and how we go about having the perspective in life of wanting to honor God. But then we see how it's going to be good for us because if we stay in the letter of Timothy, the first letter, we see in chapter 4, verse 8, where Paul writes, For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that is now is and of that which is to come again we started a new year and how many of us are trying to be a little bit healthier you know <laughs> trying to go back to the gym trying to want to run maybe one mile half a mile and the bible isn't saying that that's not profitable it is it's good to be healthy and to do exercise but then god tells us there's something else that's even more profitable that's more beneficial it's having not just good physical health it's having good heart health mm -hmm. and the heart health that we have is trying to be godly, is having to have a life that is centered in wanting to honor God, honor God with every decision we make, every word we speak, whether that's to a spouse, a coworker, a friend. And that's hard at times, right? Because sometimes spouses and friends <laughs> could, could get us a little roughed up and riled up. But Christ wants us to be patient in honoring God. We want to honor others. And, and then not only is it profitable, but then we see how now we have a life of fulfillment and contentment. Because yes. if we go to chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, we read in verse 6 that Paul writes, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Right? We, we think about gaining in this world. We want to gain more things. We want to mm -hmm. gain maybe more vacation time. We want to gain newer things in the home. We want to gain more friends. And those aren't bad things. But what God says, you, you want gain? You want lasting gain. You want something that's going to fill up your life and won't leave you. It's being content. It's being satisfied with honoring God with your life. If we focus on having that attitude that Christ had of saying, I want to honor God and revere God in how I live my life. And if that satisfy you, that is what God says is going to give you the great gain, the gain that is permanent. Uh, very good. I love that. I love that. One of the things I touched on is we sometimes think godliness is the outside. Mm. And in 2 Timothy, I think it's 3, 5, he says, he talks about having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Mm. So sometimes, we, again, we think godliness. I'm going to be clean cut. I'm not going to have this or whatever. I'm going to do this. But the power from godliness comes where? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And it comes from the intentionally adding this to our faith, right? Adding this to our knowledge. Adding this to our self-control. Adding this to our perseverance. I'm going to choose 
to be godly. But I can't do that on my own, right? It's the power thereof. And we humans, we, you know the word legalism. We tend mm-hmm. to be legalists, and we want to confine this to a behavior. It's really deep inside, right? It's yeah. a deep inside change that has to happen in each one of us. And we talked about that last time, right? Yeah. Out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. Do you want to speak like Christ? Do you want to act like Christ? Well, what's in your heart? If your heart has Christ and reveres Christ, you're going to speak like Christ. Yes. You're going to have a God-honoring life. And I love what you said, though, Pastor Mark, because it's so true. Uh, as preachers, as pastors, it's easy to tell people what to do. The Bible says do this, and then you're saying, okay, I'm going to do it because I was told to do it. But something that I think it's, it's so important, something that I, we, we focused on as a church all of last year on is, is not just telling you what the Lord tells you to do, but telling you where where you get the power yes. to do it. Because honestly, we're not going to be able to be godly on our own. No. We could try all of our lives to be godly, and we're still going to come short. Yes, we're still going to come short. Romans 6, is Romans 7, the things I want to do, I don't do. If Paul struggled with godliness, I'm certainly going to struggle mm-hmm. with godliness. We're all going to struggle with godliness. We're going, to, we're going to go on to that for what he wrote is called mutual affection. Okay, and and that word is, is literally in Greek, Philadelphia. And if you're familiar with the city of Philadelphia, it comes from philos, which is love, and Delphi, brother. It's this. It's Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, and it's that love for the brethren, right? Amen. John says, "Hey, how can you not love your?" Uh, brother who you've seen and and say you love God who you can't see. If you don't love your brother, you have a problem loving God. So we're going to stick it. John has, interesting enough, wrote a lot about brotherly love, where Paul wrote to Timothy a lot about this attitude of godliness. Let's talk about this attitude of brotherly love. Right. So we we see some verses here in in John verses... uh... 34 in chapter 13. Let's get a refresher of, of why it's so important that we speak about love because Jesus talked about the importance about our lives as Christians revolving around doing one thing and that's love. We know that Jesus said in, in John 13 verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And the very next verse says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So now we have this challenge as Christians is saying we love because God first loved us. Everything we have is revolved around love. And now as being followers of Christ, trying to be godly, and that's why I love the progression that, Mm -hmm. that Paul uses here. It's saying, hey, you're being like God. There's godliness in your life. You want to have the heart and attitude of God. Now do what God is asking you to do is, is demonstrate that brotherly love um, to those around you. And and brotherly love is very special. The way I think of brotherly love is, who are the people that you are naturally drawn to, the people that you enjoy? Mm -hmm. You know, I think about how Super Bowl's coming up, right? I'm a little, I'm still in mourning about the Cowboys, but (laughs) we're not going to talk about that uh, too much. But I think if if I were to have a Super Bowl party, who are going to be the people that I would invite? You know, Mm -hmm. they're they're my friends. They're the people that I'm going to enjoy uh, watching this game with, people that I'm going to enjoy uh, being able to spend some time with and eat with. And I think that's, it's good for us to have friends and to have family. God gave us those gifts. But guess what? God wants us to be able to grow that group of family and friends. And more so, he wants us to grow that brotherly love. He says, you have, a, you have your inner circle, great. Make it bigger. Go share more of that brotherly love. Go try to enjoy others the way that you enjoy your best friend or your sister or your brother. Mm -hmm. I think Rick Warren, I'm going to take that if, uh, and we learn brotherly love by being in the body of Christ, Mm -hmm. don't we? I mean, you know, uh, sometimes we share, I mean, Robert and I are different generation, different ethnic backgrounds, raised differently. The one thing we have in common is salvation, right? Mm -hmm. We care about each other because we see God in each other. I mean, I'm not his natural enemy. He's not my natural enemy. And, and, and God teaches us to love one another through the body. By this, all men will know you're my disciples. I mean, you, you can go on YouTube and see horrible stuff, people picking on churches, you know. A lot of people, there's a church here abundant that people pick on because it's successful. God love them. They're doing the will of God. 
I love the church. I think Robert loves it. One thing we share in the thing is we love the church of God. And we're the churches that preach the gospel and teach the truth. We love. And by the way, you're, tell them your church. I'm sorry, I introduced. I'm New Wine. Tell them about your oh, church yeah, and where yeah, you yeah. meet. I mean, uh, Y'all are always welcome to come by. Our, our church is called Casa Ecclesia. Casa, mi casa es tu casa. It's home. Yeah. And Ecclesia is Greek for church. But, but I think that's it. Is when we talk about church, when we talk about the body of Christ, it's home. It's home, yes. You know, where God is, where the Father is, we're home. Yes. And we want to be home. That's why we invite people into our homes, our friends and our family. Yes. That's when we're able to share brotherly love is in a home. Yes, and, and that's so true. And, and that's how we grow one another. Again, how can you love, say you love God if you don't love your brother? Mm. And so th this is this thing. So we want to be for one another. You know, those who are stronger must carry the weak. Again, I say, who's the most spiritual in the husband and wife? The one who asks for forgiveness or says they're sorry first. Mm. And unfortunately, in my household, that's my wife. So oh. I tell people in many ways, she's much more spiritually than me. You know, we strive for unity. Again, we're, we're all different. We have different views. We have different teams. We like the Cowboys together, so we don't fight over that. But uh, again, there's so many differences, but the one thing we have is Christ. We're united in Christ, which, by the way, is the name of the show. And the thing right. is that we are united in Christ. Uh, these things, again, John continued, these things I command you that you love one another. God said, you got to love one another. And I think it teaches us about the love of God. Again, there's nothing good in my flesh or your flesh, no, is there? Not at all. There's nothing good in either of our flesh, and yet God loves us. Amen. And so God commands us to love one another. And, and that's the love of the body that he puts in each side of one of us. Uh, Rick Warren says, if you're, not, if you're not in a church, you're a Christian, not in a church, you're an orphan. Mm. You won't know the love of God. You won't know the love of the brethren if you're not in a church. And many people are not in churches because they've been hurt by churches, okay? They've been hurt by other Christians. And, you know, Jesus said offenses must come. And unfortunately, we get offended sometimes by our brothers and sisters in Christ. We might get offended in church. We can be passed over for a ministry or whatever, but we only grow up in the body of Christ. We only can get to know him better by knowing each other, right? Because guess what? I know in part, Robert knows in part, each of you know in part. If I don't know you and get to know you, that's a part of God I may never get to know. And the more I know him, the more grace in my life, the more peace in my life. So I love, uh, I think your attitude on Bible studies like ours, we're going to learn together. Amen. You know, Robert and I don't spoon feed you the Bible. Here's, you know, this is this, this is this. We grow together in reading and studying the Bible together. We grow together in fellowship in the body of Christ. Amen. Want to comment on that? or No, it's an, I, I started thinking about <coughs> the importance of growing together. Imagine a, we're one body, right? Mm -hmm. We're all have different members of the body. And imagine if you, you go to the gym and as, as, you're, as you're entering the gym, some guy walks out and he has this huge right arm. <laughs> then his left arm is all skinny and then he has one really, really big left leg and his right leg is all skinny. He's all out of proportion, right? But sometimes we can look like that as a church because we're supposed to grow together. The right arm and the left arm, the right leg, the left leg, all of us need to grow together together. And the way that we do that is, is by, well, by being present. What, what Pastor Mark says is, is true. One of the reasons we, we avoid, not, not just not even going to church, but sometimes one of the reasons we avoid spending time with people is it can get messy. People are imperfect. We all have flaws. We all are going to fail others, and, and people have failed us or are going to fail us. But then God knew in all of his wisdom to set up a church, why would he have this church set up where people would all come knowing that they're all flawed and all imperfect? It's because it's in a place of imperfection and flaws mm -hmm. that we could learn what, what true love is, that we yes. could learn how to, how to love the way God wants us to love. I tell you, the people, some of the people that I love most in my life 
are my sisters. Now, ask me if growing up with them was easy. We had our moments, right? But it's because we had those moments and that we were able to physically have to be there and learn how to be merciful, learn how to be patient and forgiving. But then since we were also get there together, we learned how to appreciate one another and value each other. Our personalities are different between me and my sisters. But and when you spend time with people, you start to see them the way God sees them, the way God designed mm -hmm. them. And then your love starts growing for them as a brother. I love my sisters, but that took some time and, and being able to spend so much time with them well, what does God desire for us? Let's go get plugged in. Go get plugged in. Go, go spend time with the other. Each of us have gifts, right? The body, everyone has been given in gifts for the benefit of all. And sometimes we see those gifts in other people, you know. I have more of a teaching gift, okay? Uh, Robert is a teacher, too. He's maybe more evangelistic than me. My, my friend and mentor, Dale, is an evangelist at heart, great pastor, but evangelist at heart. And, people, and some people have the prophetic gift. Mm. Some people have the working of miracles gifts, the healing gift. And those are the gifts that are in the body. Paul says, I'm glad you all you speak in tongues. I wish you all prof mm -hmm. were prophesied. Uh, you know, he, he wants people to be prophetic, and that's not Isaiah prophet, thus saith the Lord or whatever. That's the edification and the building oh, yeah. up of the body. You know, I believe the Lord's telling you, you know, get plugged in and grow back. You know, the, the, that's the prophetic that that's for the word. We let fear do that. And, and in the body, we want to encourage one another. In the body, we want to be a safe place to grow together, right? To, to make mistakes, right? Oh, yeah. And to still and to be forgiving. And the uh, only way we grow up to be adults, right? That's it. Again, how do you grow up to be an adult? You grow up with sisters, right? That pull your hair or whatever. You pull their hair. Mm -hmm. and, we went back and, and forth. Yeah, and grow up. And we grow up to be responsible citizens. Well, that is what uh, in the, the version we read called mutual affection, the brotherly love. And after he says we grow in brotherly love, then we grow in what is the other love. And, the, uh, and that is uh the word agape, and most of you have heard that, and we call that the godly love, but I, there's two verses here that tell me not only is God love, but men show agape love, but sometimes for the wrong reasons oh. or whatever. But we would define agape, uh, w ag the giving love, the self-sacrificing love. Unfortunately, we can have agape love for heroin. We can oh. have ag agape love for fentanyl that we're willing to pay everything for it. So you want to look at these 316 and 319 and kind of elaborate on those? Yeah, well, I think it's one of the verses that is most well known, hopefully by all. Hopefully you, you, yeah. you know this verse by heart is John 316 for God so loved or had so much agape for the world that what did he do? He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do we see the, the action and the application of that type of love? Yeah. It's, so w w when I think of love, I think of good will. It's, it's this good will towards man. It's I want you to have a better life. I want you to be healthy. But sometimes that, that's going to come with a price. And the price was sacrificing his one and only son. So sometimes when we put others first, when we have an agape love for people, that means we're going to have to sacrifice of ourselves, of our time, our energy, our money to be able to put their will, their goodwill for our goodwill for them, their best interests first. And I think that's, that's, that's why it's, it's hard for us to do it because as humans, we're a little selfish and, and we want to put our will first but now it's no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us, having the attitude of Christ, being godly, and now wanting to love like Christ, which means do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility yes. value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. It's outdoing one another and being able to give. That's and this is what the... Love. Philadelphia love, the mutual affection kind of opens the door to that That's we can good. actually begin to love agape style. That's not the world's love, other no. than it says men love darkness. Men agape darkness because their deeds are evil. So we understand, we know agape love in some way, but God's saying, no, the love I'm giving you is, well, greater love is this that a man would lay down his life for his brothers. You know, that that is the, the thing that 
it's the culmination of this thing that we're adding to our faith as we go through these things. And if you want to look at the, the last verses here, you want to re- do you mind reading those at the bottom there? Yes, sir. Again, this is a Second Peter uh, chapter 1. We'll finish with verses 8 through 9. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Yeah, so if we are sh- or if we we're short on goodness, if we're short on knowledge, if we're short on self-control, if we're short on... Per- and we're short on all these, but we're growing these. We're making the effort. We're short on this. We're short on godliness, mutual affection, and agape love. If we're short on this, you know, we're nearsighted. And we see a lot of nearsightedness in the church today from our reactions and stuff like that. But God, thankfully, is graceful, right, and merciful, quick to show mercy, slow to anger, kind of like with the children of Israel with this church today. Again, make every effort, be diligent in your life to add these things to your faith. You know, he's given you a measure of faith. These are the things I love this. If you have these, you're not going to be barren or unfruitful in your life. And uh, you're going to, again, that's the living of grace and peace abundantly in your life. I'll give you a minute to, well, we got a minute left. Why don't you do a 30-minute summary and then pray and close us out. Right, well, remember that we, we've been called to be able to live like Christ, to have the attitude of Christ so that we could be fruitful and productive. Remember, this comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we have the power of the Holy Spirit by believing and following Christ. So we encourage you to give your life to Christ. And if you haven't, what you have to do is saying, Jesus, I believe that you are Lord and Savior. I want to follow you. Help me to follow you. And Father, for all those who have already given of their lives, we ask that you bless them and equip them so that they can live lives worthy of you, fruitful and productive. We pray this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ, the King and Savior, said amen. We look forward to seeing you when we see you again. Amen. Thank you and God bless. Have a great one.